I'm so happy for you. All right, we are uh, getting started here. Um, we are on session five on page 39. And as we begin, um, I want to kind of clue you in on some, some insider baseball here, okay? Uh, debates that, yeah, not actually baseball, but theology baseball. Debates that people have, you know, the... So you have the different levels. You have the academic level, and they're the ones they write the books and go to the conferences and, and teach the classes. And then you have the pastoral level, where John and I are at, that we read what they write and compare that to scripture, and then we, you know, helps with our preaching and, and such. In the academic level, there's been a conversation in recent years, and it actually kind of blew up uh, a little bit this uh, uh, at a conference recently um, where some high, you know, well-known authors and, and others are kind of debating back and forth on the question, what is the gospel? Now, it seems like a well, duh, yeah. we know what that is. It's a good news. <laughs> However, the question is over. You have what a lot of people, or let me just let me just ask you. When I say what is the gospel, what comes to mind? What words do you throw out there? The good news of Christ. I Christ? was taught from a fundamental independent KGB only Bible Down Church. The death the burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's 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 in Corinthians, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. First part of Corinthians 15, that he died according to the scripture, he was raised from the third day. All right. Yeah, 15, one through four. Yeah. Yeah. So death and, and resurrection. All right. Of course, we're talking about Jesus here. Okay, anything else? What comes to mind? Me, what? I think the gospel, I think uh, it's the good news, but it's the good news that, that God made a way, a way for me to be reconciled. Before then, I couldn't be. All right, so recon reconciliation. Uh, all right. Redemption. Redemption. Okay. And there's a lot of other words we can throw on here salvation, forgiveness. Uh, but mainly focusing on the death and resurrection. Jesus died for our sins, and he rose again, and so we have eternal life, or the promise of eternal life. However, I want to draw your attention to Mark 1.15. Mark 1.15, and, and uh, you can pull it up in your Bible, your Bible app. I also have it on page 40 there. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God, the gospel, and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Okay, this is the good news, the gospel that Jesus preached that the kingdom of God is near. It's at hand. All right? And so the insider baseball, the, the question of the gospel, <clears throat> it really, the, you have some people uh, trying to reconcile, okay, when we talk about the good news, you know, some of it's, okay, what do we lead with? Well, what do we lead with? Do we go straight to 1 Corinthians 15? And, I mean, let's be honest here. This is very much seems to be an emphasis in the writings of Paul. Or do we go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? 
and the emphasis of Jesus. And then because we believe in the unity of scripture, we understand these connect. Okay, they do connect. But the question is how? And for a long time, for a long time, the emphasis, at least in the American evangelical church that I grew up in, that a lot of us grew up in, the emphasis was not on kingdom of God. The emphasis was on the death, burial, resurrection, leading to individual salvation. The gospel of grace. Yes. Yeah. Instead of the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of grace, which it might be the same, but <laughs> when you noted 15 here, the last few words of it was how on that to get into it. Repent and believe in the gospel or believe the good news that the Savior had come. Right. Paul's is not that the Savior had come, it's in the end, it's though what he did, he died. Of the scripture, he was buried. He ran right. on the third day, according to scripture. The result of what he did, not that he was there. Yeah, and so some of how this debate has has shaken out is you had this this shift. You know, you have you have some people um, night. Scott McKnight, uh, one of the prominent authors that was kind of involved in this recent um, uh, intellectual scuffle, <laughs> writing writing letters and, and blog posts and, and commenting on, on things. Um, Scott McKnight has a few books about the kingdom of God. And in one of those, The Kingdom of Conspiracy, he can... He makes a distinction between the skinny jeans preachers and the pleated pants preachers. All right. <laughs> the skinny jeans and the pleated pants. And, and the, the idea there being that some of the newer, uh, younger guys on the, on the theme were really emphasizing the kingdom of God stuff. And it goes all the way back to you know, even the 1920s, and so they're talking about the social gospel. Because if the kingdom of God is near, the you look at Jesus' teaching, stuff like uh, the parable of the sheep and the goats, you know, whatever you did for the least of these, my brothers, you've, you've done for me, this kind of call that we need to uh, not only preach about individual salvation, but we need to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, uh, visit those in prison. This kind of became known as the social gospel. At times, this was very much highlighted by people who didn't really believe the, the rest of it. <laughs> you, had, you had groups who kind of, eh, we're not so keen on the whole supernatural stuff. Uh, but we really like Jesus' teachings, so let's do what he says and ignore what he did. <laughs> and then you had this fundamentalist reaction that said, okay, we, you know, that social gospel that really smacks of communism and, and socialism and other stuff, that's what all the liberals are teaching. So we're going to push back against that, and we're going to dive in on the fundamentals The fundamentals and fundamentalism of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and you know, really kind of lean in and lead on that. Um, and then, okay, years later, we were still having this debate: Is it the kingdom of God? Is it the death, burial, and resurrection? Um, and how do these two connect? And you notice that the, the writings, um, even like uh, late 90s or so, that's when the Divine Conspiracy was written. Dallas Willard, um, really phenomenal Christian author, 
he uh he wrote to the divine conspiracy kind of drawing out and what is the divine conspiracy is that the kingdom of god is at hand okay and since then and till today we've seen this more and more emphasis on this idea of the kingdom of god uh so okay one of the reasons why i'm doing this is because i took a bunch of discipleship materials that are trying to do what what mine is trying to do and kind of went through it okay what what do they have in there what are they where are they leaving out where are they missing very few touch on kingdom of god very few it's like i uh, was just ignore that part <laughs> And yet Jesus came preaching the kingdom of God is near. His parables are about the kingdom of God. Um, he tells his disciples, you're not going to die. You know, there are some of you who will not taste death before you see the kingdom come with power. Jesus was all about the, this kingdom idea. And so we can't ignore it. We absolutely cannot ignore it. Um I will say there's another thing about the, the kingdom of God here. There was a group, and, uh, you know, TC knows this full well, that looks at the kingdom of God as something for the future. Okay. In Revelation, it talks about this thousand-year reign of Jesus, the millennium. Um, and so there are some who they take the, what Jesus says about the kingdom, they take even, uh, the sermon on the Mount and say, well, that's not for today. That's for the millennial kingdom because the gospel of grace, you know, surely Jesus isn't giving us a, a, a more law in the sermon on the Mount. You heard it said, you know, don't kill, but I tell you, don't even be angry. And so they say, well, those that teaching is for a different dispensation being the millennial age. And so the kingdom of God is not near at hand, but yet that's what Jesus says. Okay, so just another reason for this kind of divorce that we're now trying to patch up and bring back together. All right? Does that make sense? It can be confusing. <laughs> uh, John 18, when Jesus is talking to Pilate, and he's asking, are you, king of, are you the king of the Jews? My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom was of this world, my servants would fight. So Jesus right there says, I came to bring the kingdom, but the kingdom is not of this world. I think it's talking the spiritual kingdom, and the Jews rejected the, that kingdom coming in, that physical world kingdom. And, right. And so it can be confusing, just with verses like that right there. Oh, well, yeah. And Jesus also says, I think it's in Luke, that the kingdom of God is within you. Yes, it is. Okay. So to, to that point, did Jesus come offering the millennial kingdom? And then the Jews rejected it, so we're going to switch to Plan B, which is the cross. Well, I don't, I don't think God, God doesn't have Plan Bs. God, <laughs> knows there's only one plan. Right. <laughs> A Amen. Amen. So, kingdom and the cross, they're they're tied together. So I'm reading a fascinating book by uh, Jeremy Treat. Is actually kind of his. Uh, 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 doctorate dissertation turned into a kind of a book form it's it's not bathroom reading <laughs> okay so it's a little deeper than that but it, it is very good and it, it, he talks about the connection between kingdom and the cross and his point is that on the cross that's when jesus receives the kingdom that's when he shows himself as the king we, we talked about this last week um, where Genesis 315 
he will crush the head of the serpent and the serpent will strike his heel. That the kingdom of God comes not with fighting by Jesus' followers, but through taking up the cross. Um, and, and Jeremy Treat in his book has, I, I, I'm maybe about a quarter of the way into it, but it has this fascinating chapter looking at Isaiah and how a third of Isaiah kind of presents this picture of the messianic king. And then he goes, and then the middle section is this picture of the suffering servant using pretty much the exact same language for the messianic king. The messianic king was and is the suffering servant by whose wounds we are healed. And I especially love uh, Philippians chapter 2, okay, because, you know, if we think there's a difference between Paul and Jesus, uh, Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11, uh, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God a thing to be held on to, but made himself nothing, taking the very form of a servant, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, death on a cross, therefore God exalted him. Right, that would be uh, 53, because he, as, as it starts off here on 10, on 53, please Isaiah, Lord, bruise him, Isaiah, and when you made a soul an offering, and then you go down to 12, therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and shall divide the spoil with the uh, strong, because he, oh, he poured out his soul into death, so therefore God, as you said, on that cross, that's where it started, that's where he fulfilled it, for lack of better words, and then he got the kingdom because he was willing to be obedient even to death. Therefore, God said, here's your reward, in a yeah. sense, for being faithful and obedient. You died on the cross. Now, all things are under your feet, for yeah. lack of better words. That's your reward, in a sense. Yeah. I gave him the name that is above every oh, name. Man, that's right. All right. So, when it comes to what is the gospel... We're not just giving people, good, hey, good news, say this prayer, and then when you die, you get out of hell. What we're saying, the good news, is that the king has come, and he offers us life, not just for then, but life in the kingdom starts now. We have new life now. I come that they may have life and have it to the full. Okay? Sometimes our gospel presentations are so much about if you were to die tonight and God were to say, why should I let you into my heaven? Well, okay, yeah, sure, I'll get my fire insurance. But if kingdom living starts now because Jesus is king now. Well, that's a that's a piece of the good news. I don't want somebody to miss that those hurts, habits, and hang-ups, those trials and, and struggles, that feeling of loneliness that the kingdom of God addresses those. Not instantaneously sprinkle a little fairy magic on there, but there is hope and healing for today. Salvation starts now and not just when you die. It starts, it starts now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. Can I run a squirrel? Yeah. In my life, I have really struggled with Black Lives Matter. With On 40, there's a sign that says, if you give money to this, we'll end child hunger forever. Okay. There is, there is, and I have on Facebook shut down people that have gone overboard. And, and this is all right here, okay? Overboard on that stuff. I don't want to hear. It. I don't want to hear. It. I don't want to hear. It. But the social gospel versus the fundamentals, we've learned that people in their hearts know that they have to have a sin management. Uh, process of some kind and so they do social gospel to s satisfy or s s sedate their sin management profile 
I say all that. Once I figured that out, I it has given me peace with the people that I think are nuts. Okay. <laughs> Just say it. You know, I don't hate them. I, I mourn. They think it shows they're good. Because they don't have to change themselves, they'll just do these acts, the social justice, and then that makes them, they think they're good or worthy right. in their heart. Right, right, right. right. Yeah. That has really helped me. Okay, that's all. Yeah. And Sorry about that. So, so you know, the a lot of what Rick is talking about in the Dallas Willard's book, The uh, Divine Conspiracy, that's kind of that Rick and I are in a, in a group of reading through that book together. And Dallas Willard talks about that, that there's sin management on both sides. Mm -hmm. You know, liberal, conservative, if you want to use that language, or skinny jeans, pleated pants. All sides agree there, is, there are problems. We just disagree about which problems are more prevalent. I, I'll give you an example of this. So uh, just this week, I was seeing one of these debates on social media you know people me, 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 me. and there's some people calling to question vice president harris's of uh, christianity uh from the reports that i've seen she she's a member of a baptist church and yet she was uh had pictures of her presiding or something at a uh uh gay or lesbian wedding okay and so people are, are throwing out there hey that's you know you can't be a christian and support that but i was seeing some pushback from the other side about wait 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 a minute let's let's look at some of our heroes of the faith like jonathan edwards if you're you know, sinners in the hands of an angry God. All right, I found this out <laughs> recently um, in a book by Jamar Tisby, Color of Compromise. Uh, Jonathan Edwards was a slave owner. So, so the the pushback that me 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 in uh, social media was people saying, "Hey, wait a minute, one of your great heroes of the faith participated in American chattel slavery." Yeah, you have no problem saying, okay, well, yeah, he's not perfect, he's a sinner, but you know, he's he's still he's still a Christian. He's he's a, a somebody, a theologian of reckoning worth listening to. But yet, this Christian over here who participates in this that you disagree with, you're ready to kick them out of the faith. So all of that, whatever you think about Vice President Harris or, or Jonathan Edwards. The point I'm making there is that that disagreement over what sin is. You know, okay, is is slavery a bigger sin than than affirming homosexuality? How do we navigate the fact that there are uh, people that we would consider brothers and sisters in Christ who disagree with us? On both of those. <laughs> now, ultimately, if we tie these two together, that the good news is that King Jesus has brought about the kingdom through his death and resurrection, then I can start, I can leave a lot of those questions up to King Jesus <laughs> and focus myself on being a faithful servant of the king. Mm -hmm. All right. Praise hey, God. Sam. Yes. When is there? But there's got to be an absolute, right? I mean, I'm not. I'm not. I'm gonna pick on Harris just because you brought her up. Gay lesbian thing. I can see people arguing back and forth. But if they promote and support abortion, I have to question their faith there. I mean, there's isn't doesn't there have to be an absolute truth when you're talking about? I mean, sin is sin, and Edwards with the slaves. You know, was that was that just because of the times he lived in, or was it because he was a cruel individual? I don't know. But there are, aren't there some things where you can call into question a, a person's faith. I mean, if you're pro-abortion, that kind of stands in the face of anything that's in the Bible. Or if you're 
there's other things too. I mean, pro homosexuality, and it's it's clearly taught in the Bible not to do that. I guess where do you draw that line? And and that's a that's a very very fair question. Um, just to throw a mental uh, grenade, uh, mess it up even more. You use the phrase there. Um, is that just about the times they live in? Well, are in a hundred years are people going to ask that about Christians who were pro-choice? That well, that was the times they live in. Well, if it's an absolute, then it doesn't matter what time they're living living in. You know, so so my 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 big point is, you know, understand that that there's as absolute as it is, we are finite creatures. And we get it wrong. We miss the point so often. Um, However, all sides can agree that there is evil. There is sin. Just now what what exactly is it and what do we do about it? Um, May I? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, So I I struggle with that question too. Okay. Um, We're learning. I'm learning that there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Okay? Yeah. So, although that's a worthy point, is that the point? Isn't the point discipleship? And what does discipleship look like? Okay? If all relationships, if Lord and my relationship has to be filtered through Jesus Christ right in between us, okay, and there is no condemnation to Lori, okay, who am I to condemn? Now, pushback, if she's smoking dope outside before the, the CR meeting, okay, I'll push back on that, but I won't condemn. And that, and that's a very great point, that <laughs> I'm, I'm glad, glad we got that on, on video, on the recording. Yes. <laughs> that, that's, that's another great point. We want to talk about absolutes. What is what are two of Jesus's absolutes? Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Rick. There's three really. Love the Lord. Love God with all your heart. Okay. Love yourself and love your neighbor. All right. Yeah. Because you can't love your neighbor unless you love yourself. Mark Twain said that. <laughs> uh, another it's example. You, you were given examples. Well, let's use one of the examples of the person that is circled there. Paul. When Paul was doing his preaching, when Paul was spreading that that, that, that gospel, what did Paul say about a, an evil of that time? Slavery. What did he say? Slaves, obey your master. His It seemed to be saying, I'm not going to deal with that. Instead, let's deal with the heart. Let's get you right with God, and then you will... That will change. That will go away uh, once the uh, once you get that part right. But he again, you know, you would have thought that because slavery was they some estimate 40, 50, 60 percent of the people they say in the Roman Empire were slaves. And Paul didn't deal with it other than to say to the slave, but the slave, obey your master, saying, get the heart right, get the salvation, get all that right, and then the rest of that stuff will take care of itself. Right. And so Sam. If I could say something. So in other words, what I'm hearing is, is this is an airplane that can't be landed, right? Because there are just, you know, because I, I guess I kind of have the notion that sin begets sin. Begets sin. Like it's a growth thing. And so consequently, there's no place that we can land these airplane, this airplane on these topics to stop that from going on. Because, you know, like what TC said is, is, kind of right he only said half of it for me though because also he talked to the masters he says masters here's how you're to treat your slaves and such as that which is even equally or possibly more important than the slave to the master because the master has all the power he has all the control but whereas sometimes when we i think when we get into sexual sin there's a definite uh landing of the airplane there do not 
I mean, even the very first time that they got back together at Jerusalem when they were talking about the pagans or the Gentiles, they said, what were the two things they were not supposed to do? Avoid sexual immorality. Don't eat meat uh, that was, uh, you know, sacrificed to idols to tick off your Jewish brothers, you know, and that was pretty much about it, if I'm not mistaken. And so I think we got to be careful here that there's some things that are, yes, we can you know talk and discuss, but I think there's some other things that is pretty clear about. And if I'm wrong, I would really like you to land that airplane and tell me. All right, all right, uh, I'll, I'll I'll do my best here, and and I want to make no mistake. I do not affirm homosexuality. Okay, so I don't want do anybody get get the get the wrong idea. I'm not going to perform a homosexual marriage. Sam. Yes. Okay, just b before you get into that, let me add one thing to Jeff's comments and, and the Rick's. I think that the, the Bible is very specific also that we are to be salt of the earth. We are to bring light to that sin, especially where not to condemn the person, but to bring light to the sin and to correct the actions. So I think it's important that in our landing this airplane, we find a way to make sure that we don't step away from all this, these issues and yet show where there are those problems. And I'll right. listen to your response. All right. So, so when we talk about, and this is where I was, was going, okay, not affirming people's sin, but in CR, one of the things we talk about is that you can only control yourself. Okay. So, I don't have a relationship with Vice President Harris to go and, and have a have a conversation with her to say, look, this is what the Bible says. This is what God wants. All right. Um, so in turn, you know, bring back to kingdom terms in terms of my kingdom, my kingdom, who what I have effective influence over is, is actually pretty small. All right. So within that realm of influence do i address these issues following the way of jesus love god and love others if the way i address these things is to bring down the hammers of shame in condemnation, if I lead with this, okay, so let's say a, a lesbian couple comes to church at GCC, and I meet them at the door, I, I've, I've got an option here. Do I treat them with love first, help can introduce them to Jesus, and then let the Holy Spirit and, you know, if I build a relationship that I can speak truth into that, you know, handle that later on. Or do I lead with the shame and condemnation part and say, no, no, you're not worthy to be in here with us. See, this is where as much as we stand on these absolutes. And you're, you're absolutely you're you're absolutely right. There are absolutes, there are lines that we ought not cross. But how we deal with it? This, this, that's what I want to emphasize. How do I, as a follower of Jesus, engage with and interact with, and understand your disciples, people that you're investing in, especially if they're younger generations. They're in the confusion about what ought to be absolutes okay as we're as we're talking about the okay which is worse slavery or uh um or homosexuality and the terms these were quotes people are actually saying is i'm not going to take advice about morality from slave apologists 
And, and that was in a specific conversation. Somebody who'd say, oh, no, here's why Edwards is definitely in the Christian flock. But this person who did a, a, a homosexual wedding is outside of under, I just bring that because that's who, who your disciples, if they're of the younger generation, are thoughts are probably having. So the picture that you were painting was the online people were um, commenting on, on a post about Harris. And your point is your response to the people that are responding to Harris, not your, re your response to Harris, whether she does this or she doesn't do that. Or the yes. Thing. Or Jonathan Edwards, whether he does or doesn't. Your, your response to the person is a, in a discipling manner would be the best uh, route. The kingdom of God route would be to love them, love others, and explain, you know, a, yes. a lot, I lost my point, but you know what I mean. Yeah, a, a, absolutely. Because if we, if we go, you know, the kingdom, you said, my kingdom is not of this world, otherwise my disciples would fight. Mm -hmm. If we decide, okay, we're going to be the social media warriors and we're going to get it there and yell at and scream and type in all caps and post memes about our enemies. If we do that, we're not doing according to the kingdom. We're doing according to the world. Sam? You're holding hands and doing kumbaya. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah the, you're, you're absolutely right there. This, this is not, oh, they're, throw out all the rules, just say everything's okay. No. I'm just saying when you have those conversations, make sure you're doing it out of love and not anger. It's your approach. All right. All right. So, That's Sam. Yeah, go Sam. ahead, Jeff. Oh, okay, I didn't. I thought I was afraid I was interrupting someone. So, in other words, I I think I'm understanding then. Landing the airplane then is really the response. The landing of the airplane is not the at the door, where you say you can come in or you can't come in. But the landing of the airplane then is a response after the person comes in. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. It, you you build a relationship, a loving relationship, so that. Um, like Jesus with the sinful woman who came and was crying, weeping at his feet, he say, hey, I see you. I love you. Your faith has saved you. Now go and sin no more. Okay. One, one thing, though, that I would, I, I remember way back, I mean, we're talking like 40, 50 years ago, there was this book that was coming out that was really popular. And unfortunately, it was kind of popular in some churches too called transcendental meditation. I don't know whether you remember that or not, but one of the, 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 you know, there were four phrases, you know, one of them was I'm okay. You're okay. And another one was I'm okay. You're not okay. And then another one was I'm not okay. You're okay. And then the last one was I'm not okay. You're not okay. And it just created a mess. And I think sometimes as a church, we have to be very careful with being, I'm okay, you're okay, let's just get along. Right. That is, you know, grace says God loves us where we're at. It doesn't say he's, he'll let us stay there. Yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a big fan of, okay, let's let the alcoholic keep being an alcoholic. Don't ever address his alcoholism. No. But you got to have a loving relationship because if you just go blasting the alcoholic, he or she's going to retreat further into alcoholism after calling you a bunch of nasty names and you've lost whatever influence you had. So what a great example of what you're wanting to do would be uh, 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 Paul towards Philemon. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's a great example because he, he addressed the slave issue not saying you can't do this, but he got involved in it. Yeah, I and mean, he even says it. if he did anything wrong, put it on my account. Yeah, as a, as, as a brother to a, to a brother. Yeah. that you know, like Philemon, you you owe me your very your very self. Mm -hmm. So accept Onesimus back as a brother. Absolutely, that's what I'm trying to say. That's what the kingdom approach to these issues. It's not 
there's no issues, but it's also not, I'm going to shove it down your face how evil and wrong you are. It's, I'm going to introduce you to Jesus, and we're going to, and when you hold yourself up next to Jesus, the Holy Spirit has a way of, of getting in and starting to mess with, mess with you, right? I feel like John's sermon today, pretty cool picture painted there. So, there, I believe it's fact. I can't change anybody but myself. Okay, I can't change my wife. I can't change my wife. I can't, I can't, I can't change anybody but myself. I can develop a relationship with Lori where they trust me, and then I can make a request. Okay, a request is a really cool vehicle for discipleship because that requests most generally will be agreed to because people tend to want to now we're on the same plane we're in the same boat we're in the same and whatever the request was you know thinking strictly of discipleship then we can move forwards but without a relationship before the request then that it is condemnation and condemnation only results in a response of condemnation back with anger and and there is no ability then the bottom line what i was studying is that that same request that we have with individual people here on earth okay that we're disciples you know we're touching they're in our domain is the same form of communication that we can have with god for Lori's sake or TC's sake, okay? I can I can request to God that would you do this, this, and this, okay? Remember the the the, the Vietnamese girl uh, that was an atheist? Uh, Poot Pooty. Uh, her name was Pooty? Pooty. Yeah, 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 the, the okay. sermon illustration. And how yeah. she went and finally went into a prayer room and saw all those prayer requests with her name on it. Isn't that how we change the world? Mm -hmm. absolutely absolutely so as disciples of king jesus we want to move and interact as king jesus did okay i don't know about you but i got a long way to go <laughs> and uh and certainly that temptation to to you know, because I, I get I get impatient. You know, the the friends of of that young lady, I'm sure there are many times they want to just grab her and say, look, sit down, here's the truth, let's patience is something God is really good at and we are not. <laughs> so uh that's one thing we need to learn. So all right. Back to the material. Uh, we're on page 41. Oh, we're going to do the lesson today. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it's actually, it's all time in, in yeah. well, so yeah. don't worry about it. Um, all right, so kingdom of God. You know, we, we have a kingdom. You have, obviously, a ruler. Okay? Can't have a kingdom unless there's actually a a king or a queen, somebody who is the ruler. You also have a reign. That like, you know, it's, it's kind of weird. It's like the when I see about the United Kingdom, the British monarchy, I'm like, what, what does the queen actually do? You know, just more like a figurehead, not really uh, have that much power. Not anymore. No. So a king of the ruler has reign, has authority. But there's a third element of the kingdom, and all of this I'm just basically summarizing page 40. There's a realm, a people over which the ruler exercises his or her reign. Now, in the case of the kingdom of God, since Genesis 3 and everyone rebelled, God is still the ruler, and he still reigns. He orders the cosmos, the, uh, the 
sun rises and sets at his command, yet the people have rebelled against him, and so his realm has, has rebelled, has fled. Okay? So when Jesus came preaching the good news of the kingdom of God, he came as the ruler, exercising his reign, calming the storms, casting out demons, healing diseases, even raising the dead. He's showing his authority, but he's drawing people back into his realm. He's drawing them back into his realm to leave their rebellion and to come back to the kingdom. Okay? Now, some people accepted the kind of kingdom he was the king of, and others did not. They, they wanted something different. Somebody read for us Matthew 6, 9 through 13. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. All right. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. For me, this is the clearest definition of what the kingdom of God is. God's will being done on earth as in heaven. It's done in heaven, right? The angels obey his commands. But as those of us on earth, we have stopped obeying his commands. So where we find God's will being done, that's where you find God being recognized as king. And that's why when Jesus says the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, it starts out really small, but then it grows. It's like yeast that works its way throughout the dough. The kingdom of God started with, of course, Jesus, and the 12, and by the resurrection, there were 500 or so. And then uh, Peter and the others, they received the Holy Spirit, they start preaching, and then you have thousands and thousands. And then by the fall of the Roman Empire, of course, it's spread throughout the Roman Empire, like yeast throughout the dough. Constantinople actually made it the religion of right. the kingdom, or that Roman Empire or yeah. Well, the Eastern Kingdom part, anyway. So, where is the kingdom of God? It's where you have followers of King Jesus following King Jesus. Okay? That's where the kingdom of God is. Now, we haven't reached the fullness yet. We haven't reached the fullness yet. When we read through the book of Revelation, you see that there's this uh, this fullness where the kingdom, uh, or the excuse me, the city of God, the New Jerusalem, comes down out of from out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed, and then there's a wedding feast with the King, with Jesus. Okay, all of that is coming. We're not there yet, so it's. And the, when I was writing this chapter, it was just after Thanksgiving, but you already had preparations for Christmas. Lights were going up. You know, some places in my neighborhood, lights are still up, but <laughs> they're preparing for next Christmas. But even though the celebration of Christmas was to come, the preparations were happening now. And that is where we are. We are in the now, the kingdom of God is here, but not yet. It hasn't reached its fullness. And every day that God delays in sending Jesus to return and, uh, and 
bring all of his people and bring it all to the end, the final judgment and everything. Every day God delays is another opportunity for someone to repent and rejoin the kingdom of God. Let me make sure I'm straight. So you quoted from Revelation 21, the new heaven and the new earth. Mm -hmm. But Revelation 20 has the king coming back and a time in which he is on this physical world, but things are going to change. No longer will they kill in my in my kingdom. And we have a thousand years there because they the devil's locked locked up for right. lack of better words. And it appears to be, many would look and say that is response to the promises of Israel, where they would have their Messiah ruling the world. Is that not the kingdom of God also, even though there is flesh on the world still? Because in the scripture, in what you're talking about, the chapter 21, new heaven and new earth, there's no more flesh. So does the kingdom start with that, with the king ruling for a thousand, or does it start when there is no more flesh at 21? Well, Okay, to, to check on, uh, make sure we're, we're talking the same language here. When we talk about no more flesh, the resurrection, there will be flesh. All right, but I meant, you know, Maybe before the resurrection, people hadn't died yet. Well, during the thousand year, people will still be born. So there are still, people are still being, well, they have the sin nature still, I believe. That it, it's just Jesus is king and he rules with an iron scepter. Therefore, everybody's not being good. If, okay. if, if you get what I mean in that thousand years. Yeah. The So the thousand years reign, and you really got to get derailed if we go all into the weeds there. Okay. If Jesus is reigning as king and people are acknowledging him and obeying him as king, mm -hmm. there's the kingdom of God. Right. But the ultimate fullness is going to be, you know, whatever happens with the millennium, because in Revelation, the millennium happens, then Satan gets released again, then the battle is fought again, and then the res the the final, now the dwelling of God is with, with men. When the dwelling of God is with men, that is what I look at as that's the that's the fullness. Because God's will is always being done, but during the thousand years, there is still sinners, so God's will is not always being done, but in the 20, uh, Revelation 21, the new work, heaven, new work, right. it is always being done. Right. So, can yeah, somebody read on page 42? I have Revelation 21, 1 through 4. Somebody wants to read that for us. <clears throat> then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down. Out of the heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eye, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Okay. Now, one thing about that picture is we're, again, okay, we're in the not yet. You know, the kingdom of God is advancing, but we're still looking for the final, for the fullness. One thing, when you read through those last couple chapters in Revelation, you can't help but notice the parallels to Eden. Especially, I didn't include this one here, but later on it talks about how the tree of life is there in the new Jerusalem and the leaves are for the healing of the nations where in Eden, we push God away by rebelling against him. Now the dwelling of dwelling place with uh, man is with God where Eden brought in this curse in the new Jerusalem. There's no more curse. There's no more crying. There's no more pain. There's no more death. Um, that, and I, I, yeah, you kind of kind of wonder, and this is Samology here. Mm -hmm. If Adam and Eve had never, you know, what what if they had resisted, or even if, what if they had repented 
immediately after eating of the tree, well, this has come a lot sooner. <laughs> you know, the, the great what if of, of history. Um, but this is this is what we forfeited when we rebelled against God. Yeah, the Jews not rejected Jesus. They were supposed to be priests and to lead the Gentiles into that time yeah. that they rejected. So, if the, and another, another thing I want to say here, oh, some of some of the pictures the world has about heaven just drive me up the wall. Okay, the picture of what we're looking for, looking forward to is not we're sitting around on fluffy clouds playing harps all day, all right? The, and there have been people who said, like, that That bores me. I'd rather be with all the sinful people <laughs> because it sounds like they would have a party. Well, no, they're not. They're going to tear each other apart. The beauty of heaven is the dwelling place of God is with man, okay? That's that's the gift. Okay. Yes, living forever, awesome, wonderful. It's living forever with God. That's awesome. I Eternal agree. life without God. <laughs> no, 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 thank you. If I put down now, the adventure begins. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's when things are really going to get good. Yeah. Once we're there. Yet C.S. Lewis, this life is but prelude to the great adventure yet to be written. All right. Um, so how do we enter the kingdom of God? Okay. Uh, John 3.3, 3, Jesus is having this conversation with Nicodemus. Truly I, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. All right. And so what does that look like? We talked about repentance. To be born again is to renounce or turn your back on your old rebellious life. Start living a new life in King Jesus. Now we understand that the Christian life is a life of repentance. It's not a one-time thing. I mean, by a show of hands, how many of us have betrayed God since we first joined up with him? Probably every right. day in some form <laughs> you, you rebel. All right. So it is a pro work in progress. Mm -hmm. um, Philippians says, you know, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. So it is a work. However, a big part of that work is the renunciation of, I, I don't want to live for this team anymore. I want to live and I, and this is the illustration I use a lot. Feel free to steal it or come up with something better. But we used to play on the world's team and we wore the world's jersey and we used the world's playbook. But in repentance, we take off the world's jersey and we join team Jesus. So now we wear his jersey and we use his playbook. Okay. And Ephesians 4, 17 through 32 is a, a great one to meditate on with your disciple. Um, how Paul describes taking off the old self and putting on the new self. And back to our conversation earlier, we were talking about, okay, what, what if, what if we're, we're on the team, but we're, we, we, we still we still score for the other team every once in a while. Okay, I remember a uh, Thanksgiving football game, Dallas Cowboys, might have been Detroit Lions. No, it's not Detroit Lions. I forget who they're playing, but it was it was icy. Oh. Okay. Uh, so it was like, you know, two, three inches of slush. I remember because I was – we were it was at my aunt's house about an hour outside of Dallas, and we had to drive home and all of that. And uh, Leon Lett, I remember, he he goes and, and blocks a field goal or something, 
picks up the ball and runs the wrong way. <laughs> and I think his own teammates had to try to tackle him or, or something, but ended up, I think, fumbling it into the other team's end zone. Or, I remember that. Yeah, it was, it was awful. <laughs> so sometimes we, we got to chase after our teammates and, and try to say, hey, Lori, stop smoking weed outside of CR. I heard that right. about you. <laughs> <laughs> but, but in love, we don't want to hurt them because ultimately we're playing on the same team. And of course, you get back to the locker room, you're going to have a discussion. Hey, man, what's up with scoring these goals for the other team? We're not supposed to be doing that. Read the playbook, you know. There's room for all of that in love, okay? If one of you stumbles, you who are spiritual should restore him or her gently. But be careful lest you, <laughs> and try to help them with their sin, you start sinning. So there's absolutely room to call each other back to the playbook. But we do so with the understanding that we are saved by grace. We progress towards Christ-likeness in grace. Because I know my story, my testimony, you know, How I judge others is really the same standard that others that I should expect others to use to judge me. And I don't want to be judged by the standard of what I did when I was full blown in rebellion against God, pursuing my idols, pursuing my addiction. Um, and I praise God and then die then because. It was, it was one of those sin, oh, God, I'm sorry, next day, do it again. Praise God, I had Christian brothers and sisters who did call me back and did help me, restore me, uh, so that that is no longer a way I'm scoring for the other team. <clears throat> All right? We, we, we've covered a lot of ground today. It was, I think it all tied, to, in my mind, it all ties together. <laughs> Any lingering questions or, or uh, any loose strands that we forgot to tuck back in? Not to rehash, Sam, but <clears throat> I come back to the thought here that we talked about a few minutes ago of about sin and what's... I guess the idea of being an absolute sin is in my mind somewhat, but forget the absolute part of it. I look at the last basically 50 years, going back to the 70s, when we started having all this stepping away from um, society having a condemnation of, of sin and to where it was open. And it seems like we have lost our salt and I, I recognize that, that there's a really fine line that we have to walk as Christians and still be able to disciple. But I think that there, I, I, I like liken it to where the woman at the well, he didn't condemn her for her sin, but he pointed out to her and told her to go and sin no more. He didn't wait. Uh, and I think sometimes that we, in the interest of trying to get along, go along, we never get back to uh, turning the person toward Christ and away from their sin. I don't know how what the exact answer to that is because I recognize that love transcends everything else. But boy, I look at the time that we've lost and where we've come in that, in that walk. We have certainly not as a nation walked closer to God in that time. And I think that for Christians, we've got to ask the question of ourselves, what have we done to be salt? If you look at the scripture, the Old Testament even, 
he placed us to be right on the path of where all of the activity of the world crossed so that we would be able to be the salt of the earth. So I'm, I'm always troubled by that and then trying to figure out what that line is and, and how we walk that to bring more people to Christ without pushing them away and still being uh, the salt that God wants us to be. And, and you're, you're right on that, Ted. Um, to add another mental grenade into the mix. When we, especially as white evangelicals, point back and say, well, since the 70s, since the 60s, since the 50s, we've lost something. There are some strong voices in our culture who would say, you never had the moral high ground to begin with. Because as much as um, there were some sins in that time that were, okay, you keep that quiet, you brush that under the rug, you don't. There were other very prominent sins on open display, sometimes even celebrated, propagated by American churches. And it, it was wrong. And that, and that caused us to lose our salt as well. And so as we do this... Maybe, maybe Sam, you're referring to the, the example of the, the civil rights movement at that time when Martin Luther King was there and yeah. the Christian church was quiet. Is that what you're basically referring to? Yeah. I, absolutely. Now, I'm not... Okay, painting it with broad brush. A country of millions of people. Yes, there were churches who had it right. But there are also some churches who really messed it up and lost the salt, lost the light um, for, for a lot of us. And, and now we live here today as, okay, let's be salt and light, but let's not be selective about it. Let's, let's take a stand for Jesus in all the areas Sexual morality, absolutely. Life ethics, yes. Let's be pro-abundant life, not just before they're born. Let's be pro-life after people are born. Let's oppose, uh, oh, sheesh, Rabbi, Rabbi Zacharias, prominent uh, apologetics preacher, teacher, died recently. That comes out, he was abusing women. Church leader. I have a, a buddy of mine, Jimmy Hinton. His father, in his 60s, the man, you know, from the time he was in junior high to the time he was caught about seven, eight years ago, abusing children, preaching in churches. So my buddy Jimmy, he was who is now also a preacher, um, has made it part of his call. Well, he hasn't made it. It's become part of his calling to talk to churches about, you know, how abusers think, how they act. And some of the most pushback he gets is from church leaders who want to embrace the abuser instead of the victim. So what I'm saying is all of that is absolutely, you're absolutely right. Let's be salt and light. But let's not play the selected games that the world is playing. The world is out there setting up, okay, racism versus sexual ethics. You know, which one's more important? And we say they're both important. <laughs> they're absolutely both important. So we're going to take a stand for both. We're going to be pro-life because we love God, love others, which means we are pro-life of the infant. We're pro-life for the mother. And you know what? Even the women who make the wrong choice, we want to love them as well. Because I can't imagine the, the shame and the guilt that I would feel when I repent of that and, and come back to God. So, yeah, 
all of that to say is we have a lot of work to do as followers of King Jesus. Sam, how about this? Okay. Keep it simple. Okay. Not so much about tomorrow, but what am I going to do today? And so today I can solve everybody's problem that's in my domain. I can go out and say, communicate whatever relationship I have with, with, with the people that are in my dominion that your identity is in Jesus Christ. That is who you are, okay? Then the homosexuality, the, the, ped the pedophile stuff, the junk, the arguments that are ongoing become not irrelevant, but then it's more of a discipleship in teaching who you are, who the vice president really is, okay, in Jesus Christ. She's not searching for an identity, um, because I think that's one of the biggest problems, one of the bigger problems in, in society today. People don't know who they are. We've lost that, okay? So they do they do the, the weird stuff, okay? And they're, they all they really are is searching for who they are. And so if today when I go to Haley Hardware and the Lord speaks to me, you know, you're pretty doggone special because your identity, your identity, you're you, but you're you in Jesus Christ. And that's special. And then oh, yeah. they can build from there. So that as a discipler, that's where I'm going. Because a lot of, man, a lot of heady stuff here today. My goodness. Yeah. That's huge. And and you're absolutely right, because there's a lot that goes on in Washington. I I can't, you know, like I said, I don't have a relationship with my friend. I can't call her on the phone and say, hey, but the people God does place within my sphere, I can have conversations with. I can point to Jesus. And, if, and my brothers and sisters, I can call them out and say, hey, should you really be posting that stuff on Facebook? <laughs> you yourself have personal responsibility. I think it starts with me. Oh, yeah, the plank in the out in your own eye. Right. Yeah. Because, you know, you would say, well, that's a sin and that's a sin and that's a sin, but I'm gossiping and I'm divorced and I'm da da da. And that's all things that I've done. You know, I got to start with me. You know, that without my personal responsibility, I can't disciple somebody. It's like you just talked about, you know, telling somebody they're special. Well, Exactly. Yeah. And I, I would clarify that it's not so much that you, okay, I got to wait till I'm perfect to be able, no, it's, no, you, you, you got to, you got to be honest. You have to live it. Yeah. You got to be honest and you got, you got to be, you got to be repentant. Right. That is one of the, one of the things that a discipler needs is a life of repentance because you can mess up, but you got to own it, you know, okay. You don't fly to Cancun during an ice storm and blame it on your kids. You say, I messed up. This was a, this was a wrong for me to do. Um, so yeah, a heart of repentance, not perfection, but a heart of repentance, model that, and we call others to it. Um, this isn't a, oh, sweep it under the rug, it'll be okay, you know. And I, and I confess, there, you know, there have been couples that I maybe waited, maybe I waited too long. I should have said, hey, you guys, you're living together. You know God would want you to be married before you do what you do. But there's times I, ah, well, okay, you know, let, let the Holy Spirit will, will get a hold of them. I, I don't got to say anything. And maybe the Holy Spirit was telling me. I want you to go say something. That's how I'm going to get deal with them. So, yeah, there's there's times where we err on the side of grace and we don't call our brothers and sisters to account, call us each other to be salt and light, as Ted's talking about. But there's also times where we jump the gun and we do that 
ungraciously. And then, oh, well, lo and behold, this person doesn't like me yelling at them. Um, you know, so it's, it's tough to do, which is why we need <laughs> the Holy Spirit. Um, because if we try to do any of this on our own power, we're going to make a lot of mistakes. All right. All right. Thank you all for the, um, this is really good discussion. I'm so grateful for all of you online and in person. Um, and for those of you who, who check it out on YouTube later in the week, um, I don't know if that's my mom watching or if there's. <laughs> Hi, mom. Hi, mom. <laughs> um, but I, I do appreciate you because I'm not perfect at this. Not a single one of us are perfect at this. We are desperately clinging to King Jesus and wanting to follow him and do it his way. Um, and so that's what I pray for each and every one of us here. So uh, with that, it is about 11.50. So I do need to wrap it up because uh, I got to get back downstairs. So will you pray with me? King Jesus, uh, we love you and thank you that you have not left us alone to figure this out. Please forgive us for those times that we've been too hesitant to call out sin, as well as those times where we've called out sin in the wrong ways, like um, like the uh, James and John, the sons of thunder, asking permission to, to call down fire on a town. Um, Lord, we don't want to be like them. We want to be like you. So please help us to be salt and light for your kingdom, to share the good news, to not, to not keep this light hidden, but to let it shine. Uh, to not uh, lose our, our flavor as salt in the world, to not lose our ability to be a preservative in this world. And Lord, where, where there's some, some rough edges that, that need sanding away for us, we give you permission because you are our king and we are your followers. Lord, I pray for the men and women you are going to disciple through all of us. Whether that relationship has started yet or um, whether you, you, whoever you're going to bring into our spheres of influence, I pray, Lord, that they will have hearts and ears and eyes ready to, to see and hear and learn from you. Pray all this in your great and holy name. Amen. All right. Thanks, Sam. Thank you all. I'm worried that you wasn't recording that because I didn't hear it.